I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to restore an industrial pocket hole machine. It's a Model R220T made by Ritter, and it can cut two pocket holes at one time. This pneumatic foot pedal operates the clamp and plunges the drill bit. This tool is very heavy duty and was a really neat experience to rebuild. So follow along for a look under the hood of a tool commonly used in production cabinet shops. This tool was used daily in a pretty busy cabinet shop. At some point, one of the two drill bits sheared off and the threads were gacked up on the other spindle, so the drill bit's loose when installed. Both issues were a function of loose support bushings. And I think when this all happened, this thing was parked out back of the shop and it was just left to die. That is, until I rescued it. If I had to guess, this plate is used in both their twin spindle machine and single spindle machines. Here's a look at the drill head. It's a block of aluminum that has been nicely machined, I might add. I start here because this is potentially the most expensive part to fix. If this was totally wrecked, I would have trashed the machine. Step one is disassembly. The goal here is to replace the one spindle that has the gacked up threads and hopefully extract the remaining part of the broken drill bit out of the second spindle. Here's a pro tip, keep a little piece of leather around. It will protect a part from vice grips or bench vice jaws. Plus it will help with grip. Note the helical cut gears. I'm no mechanical engineer, but that seems like overkill to me and much more expensive to produce. The drill head has two bores that overlap in the middle, which creates a space to transfer from the single input to a dual output. Now it's time for a surgical extraction. I start by drilling a hole into which I insert a screw extractor thingy, which is a technical term. And if you've done this before, you know I have about a 30% chance of success and a 99% chance of breaking the screw extractor off in the hole, thereby creating a four letter word fest in the boardroom. Ah, but today I defy the odds. As my dad always said, I'd rather be lucky than good. With the drill head broken down, I ordered the necessary parts I needed, then I moved on to other tedious tasks. I'm not a huge fan of painting tools I restore because it really takes a lot of time. In this case, it was gonna be a pretty simple job. So I prepped by cleaning with Simple Green and a Scotch-Brite pad, and the paint was just washing right off it. After that, I rinsed with some clean water, more commonly referred to as water. And I use a space heater to help speed the drying process. After that, a couple coats of rattle can primer and three coats of paint, and things are looking pretty. On to the cleaning phase. Some parts I wash by hand, again, simple green, and then rinse with water. Then I place the parts in front of my industrial strength hairdryer, which I can't live without. And anything that fits gets run through the ultrasonic cleaner. I clean out the pneumatic stuff as well. This is a water separator filter thingy and also an oiler. This was a crusty mess and I don't think oil had ever been added to it. The parts I ordered finally came in, so now it's time to start rebuilding. The new bushings and bit holder have a nice fit and I press the bushings in with a mighty C-clamp. If I may share an experiential anecdote, I later broke this C-clamp while trying to fix my tractor. I put a pipe on the handle to give me the extra clamping power I needed, and this thing broke right at the bottom of the C-shape. When it let go, it got spicy real quick. I'm pretty sure it let off a mushroom cloud.
I don't know what this thing is called, but it is a single block of aluminum. It slides up and down on two steel rods and it's propelled by this air ram. Once this assembly is bolted down to this main backbone piece, it gives a good sense of how the tool works. This is the motor mounting plate. If you have a good eye, you can see that I'm doing something wrong, which I will discover later. Here's the bushing mounting plate. I leave this loose because it needs to be aligned with the drill head. This is the forward stop, so it sets how far the drill plunges. At this point, I thought it would be a good idea to hook up the pneumatics and go for a test drive. I was pretty proud of my work, so I did this for way longer than I needed. I wanted to add a piece of aluminum to the top of the clamp. My plan was to move the pneumatic hookup to this piece. The reason is the stock location comes out of the back of the machine, so the machine can't be pushed up against a wall, which is not good. So I used my two horsepower hacksaw to cut out the piece and then marked and drilled the needed holes. So here's a look at how the clamp and rear fence come together. It's just a bunch of aluminum extrusions bolted together. It's simple, but effective and fully adjustable, which is neat. I shall now randomly insert a song recommendation, Lazy Eye by the Silver Sun Pickups. I heard this song for the first time on the way home after completing one of my all-time favorite projects, and it's for a super secret client who shall remain unnamed. I had just gotten paid, it was a Friday, it was a warm day, it was just one of those great moments in life. I'm reminded of that moment whenever I hear this song. It's now time to install the drill assembly into the case. These are the crossbars that the main drill assembly mounts to. I use plastic wrap to prevent stuff from flopping around. I route the pneumatics carefully. I had everything assembled out of the machine, so I needed to pay attention and make sure that they went back in correctly and wouldn't be tangled. There is some lateral adjustment, so I get that set and then correct my mistake from earlier. I put the motor mounting plate on upside down. So with that grievous, egregious mistake fixed, I throw in the motor. I install the rear fence and hook up the pneumatics for the clamp. Um, while goofing around with this thing, I decided at some point to rebuild the clamp as well. The clamp is kind of interesting. This is a flow control valve, so when the foot pedal is depressed, or pressed for that matter, air is sent down the line to this valve, which allows air through at a set speed. This controls how fast the clamp clamps down. Fairly simple assembly. There's a diaphragm, spring, o-ring, and a retainer. The spring returns the clamp to the up position. So I lube up the bore and that's B-O-R-E, not B-O-A-R, and proceed to assemble the clamp. My good buddy Josh was there to meet for lunch, so he helped out, which was convenient because I needed to keep my hand on the bottom of the C-clamp, squeeze everything down, and then install the retainer clip. That was a three-handed job. And lastly, I installed a new rubber grippy pad thingy, and the clamp was as ready for action as the last action hero. I installed an electrical box for the switch up on the fence. I didn't like that it was located on the side of the machine. I also installed the pneumatics on the fence as well. These were all the parts that came with the machine. I just rerouted them from poking out the back to poking out the top. I added the valve because I'm a consummate professional. Here's a look at the finished product. Easy access is the order of the day. I move on to the spindles. The bearings were all in good shape, but they were small and cheap enough, so I chose to install new ones, four per spindle. Said this before in other videos, it's not a good idea to install bearings by tapping. A press is better, but sometimes that's not an option. So when tapping, I make sure the bearing is well supported. 
Here's a part of this tool I'm not in love with. The drive gear is held in place with a split pin and the location of the gear is what holds the spacers and therefore the bearings firmly in place. So I needed to drill a hole of the correct size, install the split pin, then grind it down. Here you can see the old versus the new. After adding copious amounts of blue raspberry grease, the spindles go in. Since everything is nice and clean, parts slide home easily. And of course, let's not forget the retaining screws. I install the drill head and align it with the bushing holder. The goal is to position everything so there's as little as drag as possible when spinning or plunging. Best way I could think of to achieve this goal is to put everything together loose, wiggle it around, and then tighten, and then check for friction. Seemed to work well enough. Here is a fairly obvious pro tip. Wire the motor correctly. There's a diagram printed right on the motor next to the junction box. This happens to be a dual voltage motor, so it could run on 110 or 220. This one was wired with a little bit of both 110 and 220 mixed together. That would clearly explain why it wasn't running well. The old top was FUBAR, so I measured, designed, and cut out a new one on the mighty CNC machine. This wasn't just as simple as cutting a rectangle, as there were a couple of pockets that needed to be machined for clearance. I added a plywood lip. This is how it's attached to the front of the machine. I then took a deep breath and drilled the very first hole. To my surprise, it actually worked. So I removed the top and added some finish. To this point, I feel like I've been lying to you. I've buried the lead, as they say. After a couple days of use, I realized this was just more tool than I needed. So I sold it to make way for other tools. After costs, I ended up pocketing about a thousand bucks for the restoration job. Not great for four days of work, but not bad either. Here's a look at how it works. This really is a fine machine and it makes cutting pocket holes, dare I say, fun. But it's off to a new home now, a much larger shop that will put it to better use than I would in my shop. I hope you enjoyed following along. If you have any questions, comments, fears, or concerns, put them in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. Till next time.